ways that the data is being used, yeah. from fueling artificial intelligence to driverless cars to um, helping cities, municipalities identify ways to expand and grow their cities sure. uh, and optimize emergency routes during uh, 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 tragedies and, and uh, yeah. natural disasters. Yeah. How does Uber use this data themselves? Well, look, I think the thing to remember is that data for Uber is an easier situation than, than other companies because we're not selling the data, right? Is that our, the whole purpose of data at Uber is to basically get you from point A to point B faster. Um, and so what that means really is like, well, you take it for granted, not here in Vancouver, but other places where, <coughs> sorry, I had to do it. Um, <laughs> but you take it for granted uh, where you, you open up your app and wherever you go, there's a car five minutes away. But what it means is that we're predicting demand. And, but then predicting demand, you say, well, we know that demand is going to look like this in 15 minutes. How do we make sure supply gets there? And how do we use price, dynamic pricing, to incentivize drivers to go to the places that are the most underserved? Um, and so that is kind of how we roll and how we think about it. It's a logistics platform. Uh, and that's how data serves it. And because we're not an advertising platform, we don't have the same kinds of issues around the data uh, that, that you know, folks like Google and, and other companies do have. And that's part of the innovation that most consumers don't see is on the back end, how are you handling the demand and, and yeah. doing the, all the predictive analysis stuff for the drivers and pushing the drivers into the right areas? Well, I think what you see, I mean, without going too deep into algorithms and things like this, I think what you see is more and more science, more and more scientists, more and more machine learning, AI experts are now, be, that, that kind of work is becoming mainstream. That kind of work is becoming mainstream, at least in tech companies. And everything from how to price, to how to market to your customers, to how to serve them, uh, is really becoming a machine learning and AI problem. And, um, it's quite fascinating to see it happen so quickly. Uh, and we first brought, we brought in our first scientist uh, in 2010. That's when we, when we founded, when we founded the company. And we thought we were so revolutionary to have a computational neuroscientist on a logistics team. We thought we were the coolest thing ever. And um, really when you go around Silicon Valley and look at the tech companies now, like that's old hat. And so you're like, well, what's next? Um, and it's kind of wild to see how quickly that's changed um, and, and, uh, and how much need there's going to be for folks who understand how these kinds of technologies work sort of moving forward. What's one of the ways that somebody else has used Uber data that's even surprised you? Um, well, we don't provide a lot of data, right? So it's not something that we've, you know, that we've seen. I mean, um, you know, there are, we do have an API so that folks can use, like if a rider sort of ex, you know, connects one app to another, that then they can see, oh, how many miles did I travel, or how much time have I spent in Uber. Um, there's also interesting sort of coupling of, you know, I like to say every app with a map should have, should use the Uber API, right? Because the minute you open apps, like you're saying, where am I going to next? Uh, but in terms of what are the, I think there's more possibilities on how to use the data than maybe there are examples of how it's been used. Um, but we know traffic in a city really, really well. And there are a lot of ways that cities can plan better, be it their streets, be it housing, commercial zoning, like all the things that go into city planning and city management ultimately could benefit from this kind of data. And so. Our, so sort of the burden is really on us to figure out ways in which we can partner with city governments so they can use this data to make our cities better. Because uh, you know, our culture, we have our first cultural value at Uber is what we call celebrate the city, which is everything we do at Uber is to make cities better. And so this has this sort of like a natural offshoot of that and something I expect a lot more of in 2016. <coughs> awesome. And I want to shift the conversation back yeah. to what people see on the front end. Yeah. Um, uh, definitely, um, you know, the ease and the convenience of the ride, I think, is very important to customer satisfaction. But I hear you're also very interested um, in the area of technology around programs like Girls Who Code. Yeah. Uh, and so I wanted you to share a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, look, um, 
you know, part of the celebrate the city cultural value is it, what it means is that, well, of course, what we do helps the city get better. We do that through efficiency. But the, the sort of follow-up point is that once we succeed in a city, we look at it as an opportunity for us to give back. Um, and so there are really interesting ways to give back when it comes to transportation, when it comes to data, when it comes to the things we do every day. Uh, but also we see there's sort of a dearth of, there, there's, a, there's a vacuum of uh, women, uh, female talent in engineering specifically um, where we feel like we're missing out on half the great minds that exist out there. And so you can't solve that by duking it out with other companies for that talent. I mean, that's a start. But really what you have to do is you have to go a little bit further upstream and find ways for women, you know, young, younger women and, and girls to know that being a scientist, being a computer engineer is not a geeky antisocial thing to do, but is, a, but is a productive, creative thing to do. And that not only that, but that there are female uh, uh, role models that can sort of show the way. Um, and what I found, what I found through our work there, and I've done, you know, I've done a, a fair amount of time, uh, sort of mentor sessions and things like that, is that those things that all those things I said, man, you go talk to a high school, a high school girl who's already coding, she doesn't even, she's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, well, okay, that's great, and we just need to figure out ways for more girls to say, what are you talking about? Like, this is fun, I love doing it. And for them not to hear a message of, no, you're not supposed to, or oh, that's antisocial, or oh, engineering is only for geek boys, or something like that. It needs to, we just, it, once you have a welcoming message, I think it sort of changes the game. And so for us, it's sort of, it's sort of like going at the source as much as possible and trying to create situations where many more people sort of, many more great minds participate and therefore make the world a better place because, well, um, we have more, more creative minds sort of at work. Yeah, one of the stories this week um, in Canada was around um, our parliament has now elected a record number of women and women in cabinet, but those buildings are literally physically made just for men. So women technically don't fit in the building with their lifestyle. And, you know, like you've said, it's about creating and going upstream. And, but it's also, again, the public face of UFU around safety for women. Sure. Uh, I think safety, um, definitely, I'm, I'm the parent of two boys and a daughter. And, yeah. and as a woman, safety is, I think, um, front and foremost, sometimes more than it is for men. And uh, that's what statistics would show, and statistics would show that that's true. So do you want to talk a little bit about that conversation? Because that is one that happens in the region quite a bit. Of course, of course. So I think, you know, the first part is we have to, we have to start by saying Uber absolutely has to be the safest way to get from point A to point B. Um, and you, that's not the end of our aspiration. It's only the starting point. And that means, well, you compare to taxis and you compare to other ways of getting around. Uh, you know, you keep in mind that the safety happens before, during, and after. Before is about filtering drivers out that maybe won't be safe in the first place. During is about uh, making sure that you're monitoring the trip as it's in progress. Make sure that the driver knows that that trip is being monitored. Remember, there's GPS tracking literally foot by foot that that, that, that car is traveling. Um, and that goes back into a central, a central system. Of course, in every city, we have partnerships with police, et cetera. Um, but that accountability is also very important. Of course, during the trip, uh, there can be signals like, well, is the driver driving unsafe? Ultimately, you can have telematics that can tell whether the driver is driving safely or not. And you can have real-time alerts on that. Uh, but then after the trip, we also have feedback. Hey, this driver was irritable or didn't seem quite right or he, was, he or she was driving unsafely. And you use that information to then filter out drivers that aren't doing a good job or who are unsafe. And the system's always getting better over time. And so that system's way better than, say, a taxi system where, where are you giving that feedback to and what are they doing with it? But that's the starting point for us, where we ultimately, our aspiration for safety and where it ultimately goes is, how can we make being in an Uber, when you are in an Uber, you're still in the city. How can we make being in an Uber, the, how can we make being in an Uber, sorry, let me say that one more time. How can we make, uh, how, how can we make an Uber the safest place in a city? 
right? So no matter where you are in a city, if you're in an Uber, what if that was the safest you could be? No system is going to be perfect, right? Cities, there's, there is crime in cities, and certain cities are better at fighting crime than others. But there is crime in every city that exists. And so the question is, how can we be a part of, bring, of, of sort of making a city safer? Um, and that's how we think about it. And we do it through technology, uh, through some of the things I mentioned, and a whole bunch more. Um, but every day, we just keep getting better at it. And more data, by the way, also helps. And what about the other services? I mean, we've heard of the, the good things you do, like Uber Puppy and you know, Uber Roses and all that. But what are the other type of services around convenience that cities and yeah. can benefit from? But they're also community building. Yeah. Well, look, we, we have a couple different things. We have one, called, we have one service called Uber Eats. So it's uh, the best, it, well, the, the thing is you push a button and you get a meal in five minutes. And uh, how does that connect to Uber? Well, what it means is that Uber, we, we believe our business is, is we, we are in the business of delivering cars in five minutes. But once you are delivering cars in five minutes, there's a lot of things you can deliver in five minutes. And so Uber Eats is sort of an attempt to extend beyond just personal transportation. And so what happens is normally you call for food. And then after you call for the food, they make the food. And then after they make it, they put it out for delivery. And then a driver picks it up with 10 other orders and then delivers it. And you usually get your food somewhere around an hour later. In the Uber Eats model, you don't order your food. The food is made. It's put out for delivery. It's put in a car. And then you order. And so by the time you, you get your food five minutes later, the food is the same age as it was before. We just predicted what was going to be eaten before it was ordered. In the same way we predict, in the same way we predict mm -hmm. how many cars are going to be needed before and where before they are ordered. Um, so that's one example. But we also do an Uber Rush, which is doing product delivery. At the end of the day, we sort of, if you're standing on a skyscraper looking down at the city and you see all the cars, we say, why aren't all those cars sort of wired up in a way um, to make the city more efficient? Well, and I'm getting a signal back there that we are going to let people ask questions. So I'm sure we've got a bunch. Um, we'll start in. We'll start in the. We'll do two in the back and then two in the front, and then we'll rotate that way. Otherwise, there'll be a bit of a back and forth for the mic. Sure. I'm loud, so I don't need a mic. <laughs> <laughs> sure, no, I don't want a mic. Uh, I want to be recorded with my being used to can't be later. Uh, so, I mean, you know as being a politician, living, living life in a public-facing way, uh, and I know it's especially difficult for you, Travis, because Uber is one of the companies that gets a lot of shit all the time, uh, and that's part of the price of innovation. And so, uh, and, you know, you more so than most, because I'm sure it's often threatened somebody's going to come break your kneecaps or, uh, uh, you know, your, your life is lived in a public way where it's actually at threat. And sure, we, you know, as entrepreneurs, as, as uh, public facing people, we get shit and people say some nasty things on the internet, but uh, people say particularly nasty things to you. How do you, how do you deal with that? How do you put that aside and, and uh, uh, keep your head up when people are giving you shit? Well, look, I, I think the security, the, 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 a lot of friends and even family have sort of said a similar thing to what you said in terms of security and safety and things like that. But I think, to be super honest, it's a little bit blown out of proportion. Um, you know, what people say online and what they do in civil society when in person are, are often two different things. And we, we just haven't seen the, it's surprising to us. Like we thought there would be lots of issues, but there just, there just really haven't been. Uh, that's not to say there isn't a concern generally, but I, I'm, just, I'm just addressing that. Um, so you, you, I guess what it comes down to when it comes to being resilient is you have to ask yourself a couple questions first, which is, are we doing, <clears throat> are we doing good work? Do we believe in the work we're doing? And do we believe uh, that it's the right thing to do? Uh, and you have to get to yes, but you should always ask yourself that question and see if there are things you can do better. Um, but the second is, are, you, are, we do, are we doing this work with good people? Right? So when I go to my team, and it's getting quite large at this point, it's like, are we good people? And are we doing good work? And if you check the box on both of them, 
okay, well then we feel okay. And we have to be resilient to what the outside world says, um, but we have to believe in the purpose and the mission and what, what it is we're doing and how we're doing it. And so what it means is when you are doing something more controversial and potentially more disruptive, it actually means you have to fall back on principles far more than if you're not. Um, and it's created sort of a, a set of cultural values and a way of doing things that is, has principles woven through everything because at the end of the day, we have to have our principles because we do get so much, there's so much notoriety or controversy, we have to keep falling back to are we doing the right thing and are we doing it with good people? Uh, you can take one more from the back. Uh, sure, I'll try the mic. Um, so Travis, thanks for coming yeah. out and speaking to us today. Uh, my question is about competition. Uh, no shortage of uh, Uber competitors, none as large. But uh, recently today I read about uh, an app called Juno that has come out. They are paying Uber drivers to run their app at the same time to collect data and they plan on launching as well. How does, how does Uber go out and try and sort of swat down all these competitions that are popping up left, right and center? Well, look, I think you could make the argument, I, I don't know about this app in particular, but you, you can make the argument that if competition is doing well, it's because they're serving customers better. And so you have to say, well, are we serving riders well? Are we serving drivers well? And how do we do a better job at it? Now, sometimes you have to balance between the two. And sometimes you serve them well, but then don't communicate well. Uh, or sometimes you serve them well and then don't support them well. Um, and so you have to find all the different angles for how you can do a better job for your customers. In our case, it's drivers and riders. And when, if you're doing a great job then, and, and you continue to innovate in that way, then, uh, then it's not really about sort of dealing with competition the way you suggest. It's, it's really about um, where am, how could I do better? And uh, the way I like to prioritize sometimes is like, well, what if competition did this? How nervous would I be is another way of thinking through it so that you can get ahead of it and not be so competitive focused, but instead say, you know, what are the things that we really should, that getting to the core of it, what are the things we really should be doing that we're not already doing? So we have uh, two up front. One there. Yeah. Yeah. My exercise for the day. <laughs> Those stairs coming up here. Right. Oh, you passed. Right. So you have a big investment in the development of autonomous cars. Yeah. Um, how, how far away do you think is that? And what, what is the role for Uber? OK. Um, so we do have a big investment. Uh, basically, the, 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 way it, the way it works out is like basically since 2007, Google's been working on autonomous vehicles. And there's a reason for it. There are a million people who die in cars every year worldwide. Uh, and I think it's probably something like 40,000 or so in North America. And that's per year. And so you go, okay, well, that's a big deal. But then what about the trillions of hours we spend in traffic? What about all the pollution? All the things that maybe even goes into to what Uber thinks we're bringing to cities, but taken to a whole new level in terms of the benefits that can happen. Um, and so you say, okay, that's, we understand why Google's been investing since 07, 08, and, and really trying to push this kind of technology forward. But then, as Uber, we have to say, well, do we want to be part of the future, or do we want to resist it maybe the way the taxi guys do? And so for us, we say, we, you know, we're a tech company, and we're, we're sort of optimistic. And we say, look, we want to be part of the future. Um, and it certainly comes with its own challenges. but. But the world of autonomous vehicles or, or self-driving cars is going to happen. And so then we say, well, can there be a form of optimistic leadership that then partners with cities for that transition period? And you know, that transition period, first of all, the technology is going to be not going to be ready for prime time for quite some time. In prime time, I mean at scale, like everywhere, that kind of thing. Uh, and then there's going to be a transition period that lasts quite a long time. And so if this kind of technology is happening, how do you optimistically lead through it and even partner with cities through that transition in a way so that we can avoid all of the, all of the problems that sort of human-driven cars bring? Um, but, 
but do it in a and make but make that transition in a human way. And so those are types of things we're thinking about in terms of when it exactly happens. There's still science. It depends what you mean, right? So like if you're on a closed road that nothing else can be on and you're just going straight, we can do that today. But then if it has to turn right at a stop sign, okay, well, there's some technology. If, it, if there's a crosswalk and there's kids crossing or even running out in the street uh, you know, or on bicycles or things like this, it gets more advanced. If it's raining while this is happening, that's not even, that's not even a thing today. And so, um, so as you get more and more real world, you, you tackle more and more real world situations, you go from where we are today to actually a point where science has to still be, there's still stuff to be invented. There's still science that has to be pushed before we're at a place where we know the difference between a boulder on a road and a, a garbage bag that's blowing you know, with the wind through the street. And do you stop immediately because the boulder just, was it a, was it a boulder or was it a bag? And um, there's just a lot of science left. So some people say 15 years, some people say five, and a lot of people say somewhere in between. And it often depends what city, under what conditions, uh, where. And so it might be that it starts rolling out in small ways in cities, and then over time gets more and more and more. And there's going to be a time where actually I think you have uh, human and software powered vehicles, if that makes sense. Question in the back. Uh, just a quick question. So, um, I think the majority of us in this room love Uber. Like, I, I use it everywhere. And I think that's why we're here. We're here to see you, entrepreneurship, culture, wealth, culture, yeah. of companies. But there's people outside, right? Some mm -hmm. of the kind of journalistic hat here that yeah. are not in agreement with this. And you, and you yeah. were asked earlier a question of what do you say to the legislation people, the politicians who want to approve this? But what do we say to those people? Like, when I'm yeah. in a taxi yeah. and I'm having a bad experience, I'm like, I bite my tongue to say, oh, I wish the city had Uber. So yeah. I'm not sure what will come back at me. Yeah. So what do you want to say to those people? And, and because that's something we haven't talked about, and I'd love for you to hear that. Well, I mean, it, it's all about who the quote unquote, you said those people. Yeah. It depends who you mean, yeah. right? So we talked about, I talked about this, this sort of the, the city at large and all the good things that happened. So then you have to ask yourself, who's against that? And so those people that you mentioned becomes very narrow. Um, but I think systems that protect incumbents and systems that prevent competition and prevent progress have to, have to be changed. Is at the end of the day, it just has to be. And um, you know, to be honest, it's not often, it's not, in most cities around the world, it's not about, it's not the taxi drivers. I like to say, you know, the situation you mentioned where taxi, the taxi driver might be not you know, maybe a little irritable or I don't know, something and you're biting your tongue. The, I like to say 